We've got before us this evening three wicked men. Men who did dreadful things. Three men, as whom we have just read, their father had not one good thing to say to any of them. Reuben failed to save Joseph out of the hands of his evil brothers and lay with his father's concubine, Bilhah. Simeon slew circumcised Gentiles who were willing to enter into the covenant and become part of Israel. Levi was Simeon's companion in slaying the Shechemites and taking their spoil. Three wicked men. But I believe that they will all be in the kingdom. Their lives are an illustration of the power of God to redeem. So let's go back to Genesis 29 and have a look at their births. Genesis 29. As we all know, Jacob wanted to marry Rachel, but Laban first gave him Leah. So we read in Genesis 29 and verse 31. And when Yahweh saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son and called his name Reuben, for she said, Surely Yahweh hath looked on my affliction, now therefore my husband will love me. And the margin for Reuben says, See a son. And then she bore Simeon, Yahweh hath heard. Levi, my husband will be joined to me. Judah, now will I praise Yahweh. How did Rachel feel when she heard those names called out in the camp of Jacob as, as Leah called her children to her on various occasions? Um, it's not my subject and I'm not going to go any further, but I can assure you, and I'm sure you'll find out in the studies, that it only gets worse in the camp of Jacob as other sons are born and symbolically named by Leah and Rachel. But that's for later on. But these boys grew up in an atmosphere of bitterness, of envy and of strife between Rachel and Leah. So that's the background. Come now to Genesis 37. The brothers are off feeding Jacob sheep and Jacob sends Joseph to them. And the brothers plan to kill Joseph. And we'll look at that a little bit later. But here's Reuben's part, verse 21 of Genesis 37. And Reuben heard it and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So Reuben's motives were good. He was clearly afraid of the, the combined might of his other brothers. But he wanted to save Joseph. But he was neglectful in the doing of it. So once they'd sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites, verse 29, Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. And he rent his clothes, and he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? His firstborn son, he should have been leading his brothers, but he has no quality of leadership in this incident. And then, if we just drop back to Genesis 35 and verse 22, we read there, Genesis 35, verse 22. It came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Just the briefest mention. Bilhah, of course, was Rachel's handmaid. And I don't think that what Reuben did was done for sexual motives. I believe it was a power statement. The sons of Leah rule. We can do what we like. And he's depriving his father of his last solace on the Rachel side of the family. And then Genesis 42. The first visit to Egypt. And Joseph treats them harshly. Of course they know not that it is Joseph. And consciences start to be smitten. So Genesis 42 and verse 21. 
And they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore is this anguish, same word, come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child? And ye would not hear? Therefore, behold also, his blood is required. So Reuben's conscience is, is stirring, as are the consciences of the others. So they take corn back to Jacob, and eventually it runs out, and they've got to go to Egypt again. And the brothers protest to their father that they must take Benjamin. There is no way they're going to see the man's face unless they have Benjamin with them. And Jacob won't let Benjamin go with them. So Genesis 42 verse 37. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. What madness is this? If I lose Benjamin in Egypt, you can kill your own grandsons, Dad. And Jacob said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is left alone. Mischief shall, if mischief befall him by the way in which he go, then shall you bring down my grey hairs with sorrow to the grave. Not a very good narrative, is it, concerning Reuben? So let's move now to Simeon. And there are three incidents in Genesis in which Simeon was involved. And we're going to find it's the same story as with Reuben. Back to Genesis 34. As we try to assess what sort of people these men were. Genesis 34. And Shechem seduces Dinah. So what was the law in Israel when that happened? Because uh, we're told in verse 7 that he had wrought folly in Israel. There was already constituted an Israel. And if you search Genesis, you find they had their laws. And the law that God gave to Moses at Mount Sinai was a codification for the nation of the laws which the patriarchs had and had obeyed. So what did the law say? Keep your finger in Genesis and come to Deuteronomy and chapter 22. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 28. Deuteronomy 22 verse 28. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed, which of course Dinah wasn't, was and wasn't, get them in the right order, and lay hold on her and lie with her and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver and shall she, she shall be his wife. Because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. So back to Genesis 34 <clears throat> and verse 11. And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give, according as ye shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. So Shechem was basically asking for the, the law to, to operate. He would provide a dowry. But Simeon and Levi were not having that. What, the way they replied was, verse 14, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. But in this we will consent unto you, if ye will be as we be, and every male of you shall be circumcised, then we will give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. All sounds very reasonable, but, verse 7, the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very wroth. And verse 13, the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, deceitfully. So they weren't being honest and straightforward when they said, you must be circumcised. I wonder if Simeon was the ringleader in all this, because those characteristics come out later, as we shall see. 
And so, as the record in Genesis 34 goes on to say, Simeon and Levi went into the city with their swords and slew all the males. Mass murder. Back to Genesis 37. <clears throat> and Joseph is going to his brethren. And we read in the middle of verse 17 of Genesis 37. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. <clears throat> and when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Now, who was the ringleader in that? Well, it clearly wasn't Reuben, as we've seen. Reuben wanted to deliver him back to his father. I suggest it wasn't Judah, because it's Judah who says, let's make money out of this, a bit later in the chapter. So the next one, the next probable one, is Simeon. And if that is so, I believe it is, and there's more evidence to come. Simeon is thinking that he can defeat the purpose of God. Verse 19, they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh, this master of dreams, the margin says, Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. They think they can defeat God by slaying him, but of course that's impossible. And there are others in scripture who have the same line of thought, uh, and, and they don't succeed either. So that's the mind of Simeon. No spiritual concept at all. And we look at the characteristics. Hatred in verse 4. When his brethren saw their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not say shalom to him. And verse 31. They took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colours and they brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. Not our brother, your son. And in Genesis chapter 42, when they come down to Egypt the first time, Joseph puts them all in prison together for three days. And he says one of you can go back to your father and bring your youngest brother. But when he lets them out of the prison, he says, no, we'll, we'll do it this way. I'm going to keep one of you here, and the rest of you go back to your father with food. And when you come again, you bring your youngest brother. So out of the ten brothers, which one did Joseph pick to keep in Egypt? Verse 24. He took from them Simeon, and bound him before their eyes. That's exactly what had happened to him, as Psalm 105 says. He was bound in fetters. They hurt his feet with iron. He, he wouldn't command his servants to bind Simeon gently. They would rough him up. They would abuse him. And he was taken off and put in prison. Why did Joseph pick Simeon out? I suggest he was the ringleader in the plot to kill Joseph. And what would he think about during his year in an Egyptian prison? So that's Simeon. First mention of, of Levi, uh, apart from all his other brothers, is in Genesis 34 when he goes with Simeon into Shechem and they slay circumcised Gentiles who wanted to be part of Jacob's family. And they're saying, in effect, we're not having Gentiles. Circumcised or not, we're not having Gentiles in our family. And in Genesis 37, he cle he's clearly implicit in the plot to sell Joseph and deceive Jacob. And when he saw his father's grief, he could have easily gone into his father and said, Dad, this is what we've done. We sold Joseph into Egypt because we hated him because of his dreams and because he was better than us. But no, Levi can't do that. So let's go to Genesis 49 with all that background now and have a look at the blessings. And they're not really blessings at all. 
There are blessings to come which you will consider later on in the series, but not these three. So Reuben, first of all, verse 3. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Reuben could have been all of those things. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. The word unstable basically means froth. It's used of the vain and light persons that Abimelech gathered together unto him to slay the sons of Gideon in Judges chapter 9. The record is written as if Jacob cannot stand the sight of Reuben. Verse 4, unstable as water thou shalt not excel because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it. He went up to my couch. It's as if Jacob turns away and addresses those words not to Reuben but to the others who were there. So the result of that, keep a finger in Genesis 49, the result of that is found in 1 Chronicles chapter 5. And these things are remembered. They're not allowed to slip. First Chronicles 5 and verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but forasmuch as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And of course Joseph got the double portion in Ephraim and Manasseh. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler. But the birthright was Joseph. So it split three ways. Judah produced the king. Joseph had the double portion, having two tribes. And Levi had the priesthood. And in that one action, Reuben lost the title to all of those things. Back to Genesis 49, verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O oh my soul, come not into thy sec their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honour, be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel clearly referring back to Jacob and that verse that we read back there in Genesis 34 about the men being grieved and very wroth is remembered in, in Jacob's not blessing but curse cursed be their anger for it was fierce and their wrath for it was cruel and indeed it was and so Jacob prophesies that they will be divided in Israel and we're going to see what's going to happen to their descendant tribes as we now turn to see how all this was fulfilled and what actually happened to the tribes of Reuben, Simeon and Levi in the outworking of these things. So let's go to Numbers chapter 16 and here we meet the descendants of Reuben. Numbers chapter 16 and it's not a good context. Numbers 16 verse 1. Number 16, verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. So they were allied with Korah, defying Moses, and they perished. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up. So there's clearly no improvement from the state of their father. In Deuteronomy 27, we have the commandment of Moses that the tribes shall stand on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim to bless and to curse once they have come into the land. So Deuteronomy 27 and verse 11. And Moses charged the people the same day, saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when ye are come over Jordan, 
Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse Reuben. He is there pronouncing the cursings, basically with the children of the concubines, not the children of Jacob and his two wives. Most of them are pronouncing the blessings. Deuteronomy 33, we have Moses' blessing upon the tribes. It's almost the last thing that Moses did in the camp. And in Deuteronomy 33 and verse 6, we have his blessing on Reuben. Let Reuben live and not die, and let not his men be few. Can't have much smaller blessing than that. Not much is said about Reuben. But when we get to Joshua chapter 4, we find Reuben in a better light. Joshua 4 verse 12. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses spake unto them. And for seven years they waged war on the behalf of their brethren before they returned to their cities on the east side of Jordan, having left their wives and their families in faith to go and to fight for their brothers. And if we go on to Joshua in chapter 22, we find that they did indeed faithfully accomplish that mission. Joshua 22 and verse 1. Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said unto them, Ye have kept all that Moses the servant of Yahweh commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. And now Yahweh hath given rest to your brethren, so return to the land. But, verse 5, take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses the servant of Yahweh charged you, to love Yahweh your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. And so Reuben, the Reubenites are sent off with this blessing. We've read only today in our readings that the tribe of Reuben were reluctant to join Barak in the battle against Jabin and Sisera. But after that, we hear very little about them at all. So what about the tribe of Simeon? Well, let's go back to Numbers chapter 1. And in Numbers chapter 1, we have the first numbering of the children of Israel. And when you work out the disposition of the tribes, Simeon is on the south side of the tribes, in the middle of the three on the south side. And the first numbering, the number of the tribe of Simeon, was 59,300, one of the larger tribes. But when we come on to Numbers 25, we have there the incident of Baal Peor. And in verse 6, we have the point of Israel's repentance from that sin. So at the end of the verse, it speaks about the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They had been brought to realise the enormity of what they had done and the evil of it. But the very point when they're doing that, verse, beginning of verse 6, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation. And verse 14 tells us that the name of the Israelite was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. So at the very point when the nation were repenting their sin, he comes into the camp with this Midianitish woman. And he's committing the very sin that the father of his tribe killed a whole city for. And who slew him for his sin? Phinehas, the son of Levi. He's learning. Simeon is not. And it wasn't just this one man who was slain. Come to Numbers 26 and verse 14. These are the families of the Simeonites. 
20 and 2,200. From the first census in Numbers chapter 1, they are reduced to less than half the number that they were. 37,100 have perished in between the two numberings, and the tribe is now one of the smaller tribes of Israel. Now, when you work out the disposition of the tribes, Simeon was on the south, the direction from which the Midianitish women came. And those tribes were the first line of defence for the holy things. And Simeon let the wall down. Or he opened the gates and let them come in. The first line of defence failed. But Phineas held the second line. And he was given an everlasting covenant and an everlasting priesthood for doing so. And there's a lesson for us there, brothers and sisters. We should all be defending a wall around the ecclesia. And doctrinal issues and moral issues. If any come unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him rejoice. For he that bids him rejoice is partaker of his evil deeds, is the exhortation to us from Second John. So when we come to Numbers to Deuteronomy 33 again, to Moses' blessing of the tribes, we read the blessing on Reuben in <clears throat> verse 6. Let Reuben live and not die, and let not his men be few. But you search Deut Deuteronomy 33 and try and find Simeon. He's not there. Moses has no blessing for Simeon. Because the tribe of Simeon had grievously let the nation down. So, moving on now to Joshua in chapter 19. Joshua 19 and verse 1. The second lot came forth to Simeon, even for the tribe of the children of Simeon, according to their families. And their inheritance was within the inheritance of the children of Judah, and it lists the cities which they had. Jacob had said, I will scatter them in Jacob and divide them in Israel. And he did. And the Simeonites were scattered in their cities among the cities of the tribe of Judah. And probably more importantly, Simeon, the tribe of Simeon, has no external border. They had let the nation down at Baal Peor. They had let the evil come into the camp. They're not given a border to defend in the land. The border was Judah's, and the Simeonites lived amongst them. <clears throat> Let's, for Simeon, go finally to Second Chronicles chapter 15. It would appear there were good influences at work, uh, and this tribe, which had caused so much trouble, now has faithful people in it. Second Chronicles 15 and verse 8. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim and renewed the altar of Yahweh which was before the porch of Yahweh. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that Yahweh his God was with him. So the, Sim the Simeonites became, although they were part of the ten tribes of the northern kingdom, politically, spiritually, they migrated to Judah because of Jeroboam's idolatry. And faithful ones among them separated themselves from the idolatry of their tribe and became aligned with the kings of Judah. So that's Simeon. What about the tribe of Levi? Come back to Exodus and chapter 32. And here, of course, we have the record of the making of the golden calf and the things that followed on from that. And Moses comes down the mount. And incidentally, when you work out the chronology, they made the golden calf on the 39th day of Moses' sojourn in the mount. The very next day he was at the gate of the camp. Verse 26 of Exodus 32. 
And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on Yahweh's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith Yahweh God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbour. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people in that day about 3,000 men. What a contrast to Genesis 34 when they were instruments of cruelty. Their anger was fierce and they slew circumcised Gentiles who wanted to be part of Israel. Here they are slaying immoral and idolatrous Israelites who do not want to be the people of Yahweh. Slaying their own brethren but doing the work of God. In Joshua chapter 21, which we won't turn to, uh, we have a list of the cities, the 48 cities that were given to the Levites. And it's interesting when you map those cities, that the cities that were given to the priests, the 13 cities that were given to the priests, were all out of the tribes of Judah, Simeon and Benjamin. In other words, they're round about Jerusalem. Nobody knew that the temple was going to be built there at that stage. But God did. And that's where he put his priests. But there was not a single Levite city in the northern part of Dan where Jeroboam set up the golden calf and, and where there were altars to false gods which dated back to the time of the judges and the days of Micah. So finally for Levi, let's go to Malachi chapter 2 and verse 4. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 4. Malachi 2 verse 4. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith Yahweh of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. And that's going back to Exodus 32. The Lord of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the Lord at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts, of Yahweh of hosts. The Levites had come a long way from Genesis 34. They had now become God's teachers for the whole nation to instruct them in his ways. And that's why God scattered them throughout the tribes of Israel so that wherever you lived in Israel, you weren't far from a Levitical city and Levites who knew the law and could teach you what it said and what you must do. So, there's the history. Let's turn now to the future. Back to Genesis and chapter 37. Genesis 37 and verse 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and literally, their hatred, Joseph. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And they tried, as we've read, to stop those dreams being fulfilled, but they failed because they were of God. Now that first dream is all about corn, and that's the major issue when we come to the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine. And Jacob's, uh, Joseph's brothers were driven down to Egypt to buy corn. 
And Joseph, it was he who sold to all the people of the land. He was on the front desk. You didn't get a grain of corn without Joseph looked you in the eye and said, who are you? No, you're not my brethren. Carry on. He was waiting for them. And in Genesis 44 and verse 14, Genesis 44 and verse 14, we read, And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, and now eleven brothers are together. They've got Benjamin with them. Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. That's the fulfilment of the first dream, when all eleven brothers bow down before him. <coughs> Keep a finger in Genesis and come to Acts chapter 7 because there is some additional revelation here in Stephen's speech concerning the sons of Jacob. Acts chapter 7 and verse 15. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died. He and our fathers... That's his 12 sons. And were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulchre that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. Now Stephen is telling us that not only the coffin of Joseph, but the coffins of his 11 brothers were carried through the wilderness, brought into the land, and they were all buried together in Shechem, all 12 of them. Reuben, Simeon and Levi are buried there to this day. But they are responsible to the judgment. They knew the truth. God had revealed it to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So they will be raised. But what is the judgment going to be? What is the judge's verdict going to be upon these three men who in their lives did such terrible things? Well, on the way back to Genesis, call in at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. <clears throat> and here they are. Daniel 12 verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. Now come back to Genesis 37 and verse 9. Genesis 37 verse 9. And Joseph dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come down to bow ourselves to thee to the earth? They're not depicted, the brothers, as sheaves. They're depicted as stars. And at the time of this dream, Rachel was dead. And search the record in Genesis... Jacob never bowed to Joseph in this life. He fell on his neck and kissed him, but he never bowed to him. All this has yet to be fulfilled. And I believe it will be. And the eleven will rise. And they will see Joseph. And they will bow to him and say, you saved us, you've got us here. Because I believe the message of the second dream. We know that on the authority of Jesus, that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob will be in the kingdom. Part of the message of this second dream is that they will all be there. And we're going to find some more evidence for that in a minute. Now, amazingly, in the scriptures, there are more than 25 lists of the sons of Jacob. 25, more than 25 different lists of the sons of Jacob. Sometimes it's the order of the tribes, sometimes it's who is included and who is not included. They're not always 12 or even 13. 
Two of them are in Ezekiel 48 and another one in Revelation 7. We're going to go and look at those now. Because now we're in the future. We're in the kingdom. The temple has been built. So Ezekiel 48. And as we go through the details of where the tribes are, we find in verse 7, the border of Reuben from the east side to the west side, a portion for Judah. And the border of Judah from the east unto the west shall be the offering which he shall offer. It's the holy oblation. And then, further down, I'll find it in a minute. Verse 22, from the possession of the Levites, from the holy oblation, and from the possession of the city, being in the midst of that which is the princes, between the border of Judah and the border of Benjamin shall be for the priests. And the rest of the tribes from the east side unto the west side, Benjamin shall have a portion. And verse 25, the border of Simeon from the east side unto the west side. So in the allocation of land to the tribes in the kingdom, Reuben and Judah are immediately to the north of the Holy Oblation. And Benjamin and Simeon are immediately to the south. So Reuben and Simeon are pretty close to the Holy Oblation, which of course is occupied by the Levites, and those are the three that we're considering tonight. And then in Ezekiel 48, verses 30 to 35, we have the names on the gates. And these are the goings out of the city, verse 30, on the north side, 4,500 measures. And the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel. Three gates northward, one gate for Reuben, one for Levi. And a little bit lower in verse 33, one gate for Simeon. So again, Reuben and Judah are first. Simeon's a little lower down. When we go to Revelation chapter 7, we, we find a most peculiar list of the sons of Jacob. This one's not like any other in the Bible. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. And I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel, of the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin. It's a strange list. Joseph is in there with Manasseh. Levi is in there, which is not common. But Dan and Ephraim are not there. I wonder whether I ought to say anything about that. I'd probably better leave that for whoever's doing Dan and Ephraim. But there are good reasons why Dan and Ephraim are not there, and we'll leave that to somebody else to sort out. But what's the great lesson of all this? Come right back to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, and here we have God's verdict upon the world in the days of Noah. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And have a look at the margin. There's an unusually large note in the margin against every imagination. The note says, or the whole imagination. The Hebrew word signifieth not only the imagination, but also the purposes and desires. And for the word continually at the end of the verse, the margin says every day. The imagination, the purposes and the desires of men were only evil every day. And Reuben 
and Simeon and Levi, as we've seen them in the book of Genesis, were very much like that. They did wicked things, as we have seen. We come now to Isaiah 26. Um, that word that's translated imagination is, is a fairly rare word. It only occurs in eight other places. And one of them is Isaiah 26. And this is interesting because this is in the context of the very last verse that Nehemiah quotes in his prayer in Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah quotes from verse 8 of Isaiah 26. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Yahweh, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. And that's a very interesting study when you look at the context in Isaiah 26. But focus on verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in peace, peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Marginal note, or thought or imagination, Genesis 6 verse 5. It's the same word. And what those two scriptures put together are telling us is that it is possible to take the mind of the flesh which only thinks about evil every day and by the influence of the word of God change it so that it is stayed and trusts in and upon God. And through the work of Joseph the thinking of those wicked men was changed from flesh to spirit. And that should give us encouragement brothers and sisters. Because God has provided for us a greater than Joseph. And none of us have done what Reuben, Simeon and Levi did. It is possible for our minds to be stayed upon God if we trust in him.